pain management doctor. And um, I've worked here in uh, Arizona uh, for the last 13 years. Um, and um, I've actually been very interested in sleep apnea for the last few years. And um, honestly, my wife gets the credit for that. She's a dentist and um, she started working um, with Valley Sleep and other uh, neurologists um, and sleep doctors throughout the city um, the last couple of years where um, she realized um, that a dental appliance that a dentist can make can actually help patients with sleep apnea. And um, I knew nothing about that at the time and she was telling me about it and telling me about it. And finally, she got my attention uh, about two years ago now that um, sleep apnea is killing millions and millions of, of patients to the point that you would call it an epidemic. And as a pain management doc, this is something that I, you know, I kind of was aware of, but I wasn't truly aware of it until my wife started showing me the data. Um, in my pain management practice and pain practices around the country, we think that sleep apnea could be affecting as many as 50%. There was actually one study that showed 75% of pain patients, um, or at least patients on opioids, um, have sleep apnea. And so in my own clinics, we started screening for sleep apnea. It's something that's uh, you know, really uh, uh, close to my heart. And so I think that's why Laurie asked me to come and talk about coronavirus and sleep apnea. She knows it's something um, that I'm passionate about. Um, when coronavirus was hitting in March, um, it hit New York really, really hard. And I think you guys know that. I trained at NYU. Um, I trained in New York City and the, one of the hospitals, I, I trained at four different hospitals as part of the NYU system, but one is called Bellevue Hospital. It's the oldest hospital in the United States and just an incredible place to learn. And Bellevue during this uh, um, coronavirus uh, crisis just got hit so hard and many of my mentors and friends started getting sick. By the time it was all said and done, about 50% of my old department got sick while treating coronavirus patients. And so they started putting out kind of the call for help. And uh, I made the decision to leave my practice here in Arizona and to go volunteer there. And so I was in New York for about um, three weeks. And while I was in New York, we saw so many things. And I'm not, because I think we want to focus a little bit more on sleep apnea tonight, I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to belabor it. If you guys have questions later about, you know, New York, I'll get more into it. But a few things I want you guys to know is when we were really getting hit hard, probably 25% of New York City had coronavirus. The hospitals were being completely overrun. We had, uh, you guys, some of you might be tracking our daily numbers here in Arizona and uh, how many um, patients are in the ICU. Right now, we're at about 91% capacity. But when I was in New York, we would report it probably as 200% capacity. Now you ask, how would you ever get to 200%? percent capacity? Well, the answer is we put two patients in every room. Um, I, I remember on the news, they were talking about uh, having one ventilator for, for two patients and how we would kind of rig that. When I got there, what I found was we actually had enough ventilators, um, but what we didn't have enough of was, was, was rooms. And so we would put two patients in a room and we'd have two ventilators. Um, it was just a, an incredible thing to experience. Um, the first day I got there was, I think, April um, 7th or 8th. But I do know that in the first three days that I was in New York, we lost just as many people as 9-11. We lost about 1,000 people a day um, in the city um, that were dying. And uh, sometimes on the shifts where I was working, maybe uh, 10 people would die in a shift. Um, the first day I was there, I worked on the uh, airway team. And I'm sure some of the attendees are respiratory therapists um, um, or you know have interest in, in breathing and ventilators and stuff. On the airway team, you know, normally we might go innovate someone once a week on the floors. Um, in my first couple of days, we were responding to codes 10, 15 times a shift. It was just one of the most incredible things I've ever been a part of. And, uh, and I've talked about this in other settings, but um, we knew that many of these patients weren't going to survive. And so we, we, focused, um, we focused a lot of our time and energy on um, helping the people um, die with dignity. Um, and, uh, and if you guys have questions about that later, I can answer more, but, um, we would be, uh, trying to keep them calm and I would spend time, um, uh, asking questions about their lives and who they are. Remember with coronavirus, there's no family there because everyone's in quarantine. I mean, it, it truly looks like a scene out of like a, a movie about Ebola or, um, outbreak or one of these movies we've seen where we're all dressed in our PPE and, and there's no family around and the patients are cut off in isolation and what a terrible, uh, terrible thing for your last few moments of life. And so I, I spent my time 
you know, asking them questions and understanding who they were and where they were from and um, keeping them calm. Um, the data has shown, um, at least up through about June, that almost 90% of people who get intubated um, don't survive. And so coronavirus is, uh, is a very serious thing that um, we should all be uh, uh, taking seriously. So what does it mean for Arizona? You guys are probably tracking the data. We had another 4,000 cases reported today. We had 75 deaths reported today. Um, we've been on a pretty steady um, increase. And then over the last couple of weeks, it's kind of leveled it off, but we've been between three and 4,000 cases every day. And so um, what we should all be doing over the next two to four, maybe six weeks is really kind of hunkering down. Like this is the time Governor Ducey did a uh, press conference this afternoon. I was able to listen to some of it. Um, he came, he, he came up short of, of locking the state down again, but what he's basically asking us to do is lock ourselves down, like just make the decisions to stay at home. Um, it sounds to me like he doesn't want to make the, the hard decision of shutting the, the state down, but it would actually be best for all of us to stay at home as much as we can. This is a very, very big deal. And the three or 4,000 cases that we're seeing today mathematically are going to probably be a hundred more deaths two weeks from now. And so it's a really uh, important thing for us in Arizona to take this very seriously. Um, I, uh, I'm going to get to some uh, comments here on sleep in a second, but one last thing I'll say before I get into that is what can we be doing? It's such, it's the most important question I always get. Well, what can we do? You know, Dr. Lynch, and I've become kind of a little semi expert on COVID because I went to New York, I saw, I treated it, I got sick. And then um, I recovered. And so even when I was sick and in quarantine, I basically read about COVID every single day. And so I've learned a lot about it. Um, what can we be doing? Number one is we can socially distance. I know you guys have heard that, but I teach it different. I like to say we can socially distance commensurate with our risk level. And so what that means is if you're a 25 year old with no comorbidities and you're healthy, there's a very, very low chance that this uh, coronavirus is going to kill you. Um, now, we don't know the long-term effects, so I don't want to be too flippant about it, but it's probably not going to kill you. And so you don't have to go into full and complete and total quarantine, um, unless, of course, you're going to come back and give it to someone else who's not healthy. But I would say socially distance, commensurate with your risk level. And just to make it a little more clear, I like to talk about people in three groups. There's low risk. And that's generally been defined as 45 and under with no comorbidities. There's moderate risk, group two, which is 45 to 65 um, and maybe moderate comorbidities. Maybe you have asthma or a little bit of high blood pressure. Then there's group three. Group three is the group that we should really all be working together to protect. And that's people 65 and older or significant comorbidities. A significant comorbidity would be diabetes, uh, obesity or morbid obesity specifically, um, heart disease or lung disease. And so if you happen to have diabetes, uh, uh, morbid obesity, heart disease or lung disease, you really should be completely locked down right now um, until we get a cure. Um, and so that's number one is socially distance commensurate with your risk level. Number two is to wear a mask. Um, and I know we know this and we hear it, but I like to teach it again to say, wear a mask, commensurate with your risk level. And so um, what that means is when I was in New York, I wore an N95 all the time. I actually wore an N100 that the Barrow Neurologic Institute made for me before I left. And I wore a face shield and I wore gowns and I did all this. Now I still got sick, but I was intubating, you know, five, 10, 15 patients a day. And so it was very hard to avoid it with the aerosolizing procedures in the room. But wear a mask commensurate with your risk level. So once again, if you're young and you uh, have no reason to believe you've been exposed, you know, the CDC says it's fine just to wear a cloth over your face. But if you're a provider, if you're a respiratory therapist and you're going to a code and you're setting up the ventilator, you should have full PPE. Number three, you should wash your hands. And once again, I would say, wash your hands commensurate with your risk level. You're seeing a theme here. What I mean by that is if you stay at home all day in your own house by yourself, you don't need to wash your hands because it's just yourself. You can do whatever you want. But if you're like me and you're in the clinic and you're seeing patients and you're walking around, I carry my own um, isopropyl alcohol that I've made. I mix it with uh, aloe vera and I've made basically my own Purell. 
I wash my hands every time I touch something. And I've already been exposed, and I've already recovered, uh, but I continue to do that, if nothing else, just to show leadership and to show other people what they should be doing. But wash your hands, commensurate with your risk level. And if you have questions for me later about how to make your own Purell, I can send you out just a simple little formula on it. But you want it to be at least 60% alcohol. And you can't have 100% alcohol in your hands, it'll just eat it up. So you want to mix it with something like aloe vera or even conditioner makes it softer um, on your hands. And then the last thing um, is we need to be screening we need to be testing and then we need to be tracing. And I combine these into one step because I think having like a six step thing for you guys is too much to remember. So step four is screen, test and trace. What that means is if you run a business or um, uh, in any, any place where you're in a leadership role, anyone coming into your house, into your business, um, you should screen them. The easiest way is for temperatures, but you can also screen for symptoms. You can put up a sign on the door that says, if you've had a cough or um, sore throat or fever, you know, please don't come into our business, you know, reschedule. It's good to screen right at the entrance, not once they walk into your business at the front desk, but before they walk through your doors. So screen, and then someone who comes up positive on the screen that says, oh yeah, I had a fever of 101, then you would encourage and help that person um, get a test. Um, and then once you get a test that's positive, then you want to track all of their, um, what we call contact tracing. And so that's the four things we can do. We can distance, we can wear a mask, we can wash our hands and we can screen or we can screen test and track. So hopefully that's helpful. So let me get into a little bit of sleep apnea. Um, as I told you guys earlier, um, I'm super interested in sleep apnea. When I first came to town, um, I, I've been here for 13 years now treating chronic pain. And my best friend and I, Dr. Tori McJunkin started the practice and we talked about um, we were going to help patients get off of pain pills whenever possible because opioids we know can cause overdose. Now, that doesn't mean all patients have to come off opioids, but whenever we get a chance, we try to reduce the dose as much as we can. And we talked about it being an epidemic. You guys have heard that, that opioids are an epidemic. Well, sleep apnea is an epidemic as well. Um, it kills um, just thousands and thousands. I think, and Lori, you could uh, correct me, but it, I think it's at least 50,000 deaths per year. Um, from sleep apnea, and so maybe more. Um, it has effects on the heart and stroke and all these downstream effects on the body. And so the questions um, you know, that would come to me um, would be, well, how does the coronavirus affect sleep apnea? So I wrote down um, a few questions just to kind of start um, the questions going, and then you guys can um, ask me a few more. Um, so the first one, I'm just gonna put you on a hold for one second. That was my, uh, my son opening the door there. So um, the first question is, does someone with coronavirus, uh, are they higher, I'm sorry, does someone with sleep apnea, are they higher risk for getting the coronavirus? And after they have the coronavirus, are they higher risk of having uh, mortality? And the answer is, um, it's, a, it's an interesting answer. It's yes and no. If you have sleep apnea, you're not more likely to get the coronavirus to contract it. But once you have it, most patients with sleep apnea have other significant comorbidities. They might be elderly, they might be overweight, um, certainly lots of heart disease, hypertension, and even history of stroke. All those things would put you at higher risk of having worse outcomes. And so where obstructive sleep apnea in and of itself isn't gonna make you have a worse outcome as far as we know from coronavirus, having heart disease, which often goes with sleep apnea, definitely makes you have a worse outcome. The second question that I had that I want to address was, um, what about CPAP? Um, if you get exposed to um, the coronavirus, is it okay to keep using your CPAP or is it just going to aerosolize it into the room and infect everyone in your house? Um, so that's an interesting uh, topic. And what I would say is if you are diagnosed with coronavirus and you have sleep apnea, number one, make sure you see your doctor and that you get your doctor as part of your care because you're gonna be kind of complicated to take care of. But the very best advice, I actually went to the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and read through a lot of their um, advice before tonight, is that you need to isolate in a room by yourself. I know not everyone can do that, but you need to do the best you can to isolate in a room by yourself to shut your door, because when you use your CPAP device, it is going to aerosolize the virus into the room. And so you don't necessarily wanna be doing that next to your partner, it will make them more likely um, to catch it. Definitely uh, um, tie your doctor into your treatment so that they're um, aware. And then um, the other thing, um, 
Yeah, and the, so the other part that goes part of that is, is it possible that the CPAP machine could make your coronavirus worse? Um, there's lots of conspiracy theories about intubation and how the positive pressure on the lungs uh, is the wrong treatment. And that's just not true. There's no evidence of that. So there's no reason to believe that the CPAP device in and of itself could make you worse or could make your, um, your condition worse. Um, the only issue would be whether it would uh, spray the virus into the air and infect um, others. Um, one of the questions that I wrote down to address and then I'm going to get to some of your questions in just a minute is, you know, how does, how does the coronavirus affect sleep? And I, what I think I'll do is I'm just going to um, tell you guys my experience. So I got, um, I was probably exposed in the first couple of days I was there and I just kept working and kept working and kept working. And by day 12, I could barely stand anymore. I had to, I had to sit over and over and over during rounds when I was working on the ICU, we would go patient to patient and talk about the patient. And after I would get done talking, I would usually just sit to catch, to like regain my strength from standing. And that, that wasn't like me. And so I knew something was wrong and I won't bore you with all the details, but they sent me home and we figured out that I was sick. And the way it affected my sleep was kind of multifactorial. First, I had a fever. And as many of you guys um, probably know, when you get a fever, you have these crazy dreams and you don't sleep well. And uh, I'm not a sleep expert. And so I'm not going to opine too much on it. But certainly it's affecting your heart rate and your sleep rhythms. And you just don't sleep that well. Um, uh, and so I, uh, I didn't sleep great. And then what made it really worse was my... Uh, my oxygen was really low. And so I had good friends. I'm an anesthesiologist. So I had, you know, access to stuff. And my friends brought me a pulse ox and my sap um, was basically between like 87 and 93% for about three days. And as you guys know, that's not normal. We want it to be like a hundred percent. And by the way, when you're 90%, that doesn't mean you have 90% of the oxygen in your blood that you should. It's a logarithmic curve. So when you're 90%, pulse ox, that means you have about 60% as much oxygen as you should have in your blood. So that's pretty bad. So what I would find is when I would fall asleep, my oxygen would fall really, really low. And um, I was lucky enough to get a pulse ox machine that had an alarm on it. And I would experiment with what setting I should put the alarm on so that I could sleep but not kind of die. I know that sounds kind of crazy and morbid. Um, and I could have just gone to the hospital but I just come from the hospital and everyone was dying and it was pretty scary. And so I wanted to kind of take care of myself in the hotel room. And so I, I would kind of experiment with the right number. So I would put it on 90% and I might get like 30 minutes of sleep and it would, it would go off. And then I put on 89% and then 88%. And I, I kept going lower and lower to try to get the best night's sleep I could, but it was very kind of stressful and chaotic. And I didn't sleep very good for like three days. Um, that's kind of a long story about sleep, but I would say that if you do get, uh, diagnosed with coronavirus over the next couple of weeks, um, try to get a pulse ox um, and try to get a pulse ox with an alarm if you can. Um, and I would recommend that when you go to sleep, um, don't let yourself fall below, you know, 90% sat if possible, because as it's falling down, um, that can cause, uh, you know, brain damage and uh, damage to your heart and your kidneys. Um, so I went through just a few things, high risk and how to use CPAP, how it affects your sleep. Um, it's been about 20 minutes. I think what I'll do is I'll start to take some questions from you guys. Um, Lori, if you're still there, are there any questions that have come up you'd like me to answer first? Yes. Um, here's one. How long do the particles stay in the air after uh, being out there, put out there by the CPAP? I'm going to say this a lot tonight and not just because I'm dumb. We don't know. Um, there's so many things that we don't know. So we call it the novel coronavirus because it, we've never had it you know, on earth before. And generally speaking, you have what we call um, like airborne molecules like TB. And we know TB floats around in rooms and we got to go through crazy contact precautions. And then we have diseases like the flu that are more droplet precautions where we believe if someone coughs that it goes out and then it falls to the ground. Our understanding right now is that this is still droplet precautions, but what we're learning, and there's all, there was actually scientists this week, 209 scientists who wrote a letter sending it to the World Health Organization and the CDC saying that we need to stop acting like this is just droplet precautions because the science around droplets is more complicated and it might be floating around the room a little bit. There's all sorts of cases where you'll find it 30 feet away from a patient in, in, in a room and we believe it's floated across the room. And so the long story short is 
the science on it is teaching that it's droplets. It might be circulating longer. And certainly when CPAP aerosolizes it and puts it into the air, it's going to be longer. So what I would, um, I would act like is that any room with a CPAP machine in it is contaminated and no one else should go in there except for the patient. So oh, here's another one. If I have diabetes, should I go to work? And my question would be, what do you do for work? Yeah, geez Louise. It's such a, it's such a deep um, conversation. I've been reading a lot about the concept of frontline workers and essential healthcare workers and differences between blacks and whites and Hispanics. And uh, there are some people that would love to work from home, but they can't. Their job doesn't allow for it, right? And so my advice would be if you have diabetes and you have a job that will allow you to work from home, push really hard to work from home. But if you have diabetes and your job won't allow for it, um, sometimes you, you don't have a decision. And so if you have to go to work because you have to pay your rent because people depend on you, then you need to do everything you can when you go to work to wear a mask, to socially distance, to wash your hands. Yeah. Um, here's one. I would, I'd love to have the instructions on making your apparel. We can get that out to everybody afterwards. Um, shouldn't everybody who's out and about do all these things? Um, she's 69 and insulin resistant. She wears a mask for everybody else. Why shouldn't they wear a mask for me? I would agree, we all need to wear masks. It's, you know, to be responsible, to be socially responsible. Um, I got yelled at on the sidewalk here the other day because I was videotaping a butterfly and I pulled my mask down to like video the butterfly and watch. <laughs> I literally got yelled at by a mom strolling along the sidewalk. Hey lady, if you're gonna videotape your butterfly, wear your mask. I mean, it was like, oh, wow. Anyway. Um, I actually wanna, um... I want to jump in there for a second because I push everyone to wear a mask all day. Like if you follow me on social media, I've been putting my kids up this week, wearing a mask and just doing anything I can to get people's attention to wear a mask. Cause it really does protect all of us. The data really shows that if 90 to 95% of us wear masks, they modeled this out. We'll probably save 30 to 50,000 lives just over the next three months. That's crazy to think that our collective behavior can save lives. And so we should all be wearing masks, but keep in mind outside is a little bit different. I think when you're outside, I don't think you need to wear the mask. If you're walking down the street, the, it's not floating around in the air outside. And um, you, you, it's okay to not wear your mask outside. But when you approach people, put it on. And so I've seen some people that wear like a bandana around their neck and you can, you know, walk or run and everything. And then just put it on when you're within six feet of people. I think that's very appropriate behavior. Yeah, that's kind of what they're doing out here in California. Um, you know, we wear it when we ride our bikes, you know, or if we're on the sidewalk walking, and someone's coming, we, we just pull it up, you know, or, or we get, we have the turtleneck ones that go up on there. So, um, also Dr. Lynch, could we maybe provide a link for the oximeter that has the alarm on it? When, when I, when I reply to everyone's email at the end? Yeah, I'm so sorry. I had one here and then one of my friends got sick and they came and picked it up from me and took it. So I don't have it at my house anymore. I was going to look at the name, but I'll try to, um, as soon as we hang up, I'll try to contact them, get the name. Okay. Um, but the, if I was Googling it and you know, you can Google anything or Amazon it, just say pulse ox with alarm. That's all you need. Yeah. Is to pulse pulse alarm. With alarm. Um, how effective is antibacterial hand sanitizers against the virus? Does it really kill bacteria? Can room sprays help? Yeah, so I don't know. Um, I don't, I get confused on the wording, but I know that you need a, a minimum of 60% alcohol to kill the virus. So if it's an antibacterial and it's focusing on bacteria, I'm not sure that kills the virus or not. I, I, I'd have to look that up, but it needs to be 60% alcohol. You can look at the content and that will kill the virus. Um, here's a Facebook Live question. Can you talk about what issues you still have um, after your experience with COVID? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. And I always hate talking about because I, I feel like I always want to be strong and tell everyone I'm great. But the reality is I'm not. And uh, it's, uh, I came back, I got, I got diagnosed maybe April 20th. And so we're going on like two and a half months now. Um, the first two months that I was home, I had to take a nap every day. It sounds crazy, but every day. I go in my office and shut the door and close my eyes. If I was working from home, I'd lay down and take a nap. Every day I had to take a nap. And that stopped about two or three weeks ago, which was really exciting for me. Um, but even uh, two weeks ago, um, I was having a hard time breathing and I felt labored and I checked my pulse ox. And again, my, my sats were in like the high 80s, like just two weeks ago. 
And so one of the things without whining and complaining a lot about my own situation, one of the things I've been trying to get people's attention on is we don't really know the long-term effects. Um, the effects on the lung might be worse long-term uh, than we think. And then the other thing that's really affected me is it's called post-viral syndrome or post-viral fatigue syndrome. And you can look it up. It's actually a thing, no matter what virus it is, the, the flu or mono, um, Epstein-Barr, there's all these viruses, they hit you. And depending on how bad they are, you could have symptoms for six to 12 months um, after. So the two big things for me has just been feeling tired and then my, my oxygen still drops sometimes. Great. I'm sorry to hear that, but I mean, good. thank you for answering that. Yeah. Uh, I work with somebody who's positive for COVID. I have sleep apnea, high blood pressure, as I mentioned, diabetes. I'm off waiting for results. I have no symptoms. Does that mean I'm good? Um, I think if, if what I heard right, you have diabetes and sleep apnea. What was the other one? Obesity? Hypertension. I mean, you, uh, good is a relative term because even if you get a test, the mm -hmm. PCR test that we're using as a standard of care, about 30% of the time, it's going to say negative when you still have it. Mm -hmm. So my advice to people is if at all possible work from home, if you have symptoms and you've been exposed, then you should probably stay at home for two weeks. If you get a negative test, that doesn't mean you don't have it. So just do everything you can to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. um, somebody suggested on my Facebook Live that you might need a CT of the chest, Dr. Lynch. <laughs> yeah, um, I haven't done it yet. And it's yeah. interesting you say that, you know, a CT of the chest is a better measure of whether you have coronavirus than even the PCR test itself. The chest CT, we know when we see it exactly what it looks like. What does it look like? I'm curious. It's basically effusions throughout the entire lung. There's ground glass opacities. It infiltrates bilaterally. It just kind of has that, that look. Even with someone with mild, a mild case? Would you see that? Well, you would see, not as bad, but you'd see the same thing, which is it's affecting the entire lung, both sides. Interesting. Uh, do you have time for some more? Yeah, of course. This actually went pretty fast. I kind of, I yeah. threw it, uh, you know, quicker than I thought. What do you think about if people take vitamins and immune building supplements? Like, you know, how can we prepare our bodies other than treating our sleep apnea? Um, and how can we prepare it to not become a host, right? Like, that, that's my favorite question to answer is so often in the American healthcare system, right? Like I know you and I see eye to eye on this everything is about treating it once you have it. Like, you know, it's all treatment, treatment, treatment. We spend 20% of our gross domestic product on healthcare, which works out to like $3 trillion or something crazy, 4 trillion now maybe. We spend all this money on healthcare when if we just spent money upfront on, you know, uh, prevention, it would be so much, uh, we'd all be healthier. So I actually said this in um, some of my first videos back in April, the most important thing that you can do, Laurie, is to get, your healthiest you've ever been. If you're overweight, use this right now as like the January 1st New Year's resolution. Make this your coronavirus resolution. Get in the best shape, the best health of your life. And if you don't know what that is, um, look it up online. What's your ideal body weight? That's going to protect you. Um, any extra weight is going to make you more likely um, to succumb to this. Um, number two is exercise. Um, so get in your best shape, but you know, you can lose a lot of weight at home just by not eating. It's important to exercise and to get that cardiovascular and lung effect of, uh, have, make sure your lung and your heart is the, is the healthiest it can be. And then there's a lot of data on which vitamins make sense for coronavirus. And some of it is just kind of whatever floating around Facebook, but there's some truth to it. The ones that make the most sense is vitamin C, zinc, vitamin D, and magnesium. So those four, vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, and magnesium, uh, make sure you're getting a good healthy dose of those. Make sure that you're hydrated. This is also what I tell people when they're sick and they say, what do I do? The first thing I say is take vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, magnesium, drink plenty of fluids like Pedialyte or Gatorade or something that's going to replace electrolytes plus fluids. Get a pulse ox so you can see how you know your lungs are doing. Get plenty of sleep, um, which I, I know is close to your heart. Those are all the things you can be doing. Uh, you know, I wanted to mention since you're talking about the weight that because of coronavirus, I finally started Sleep to Slender, which is Valley Sleep Center's uh, medically supervised weight program. So if you have obstructive sleep apnea, you know, your insurance wants you to get your weight under control. It's part of the treatment. So 
um, our nurse practitioners are guiding you through sleep to slender. So if you're already diagnosed with uh, sleep apnea and you want to learn more about that tomorrow at 1230, I'll be on live. You can sign up at valleysleepcenter.com. Um, but that's another way I'm trying to get people healthy too, because that's what I've been doing. And all those vitamins that you mentioned, my internal medicine doctor put me on every single one of those as soon as this whole thing happened. Um, so it is important to your doctor, about, you know, uh, trying to stay as healthy as you can. Which um, doctor is that, Lori? Uh, Melody Rodarte. Yeah. Okay. She is activated.health. Um, she's doing a couple health talks uh, okay. with the you on um she's she's um internal medicine and she's also bariatric certified medicine so um but she's really into like natural i mean she's been taking care of i'm she's the reason i'm still here like how do you survive two cancers i mean uh, you know all these crazy back surgeries somebody did ask us a question about back surgery um they're getting are you are you think they're doing elective surgeries are they i don't know because i haven't been there are they doing elective surgery still yeah, this I'm going to use this opportunity a little bit longer answer. So I'm a pain doc, um, by the way, and um, I, this is what I do all day. And I think the balance for us has been um, keeping people from getting COVID while also treating their their health. And when this first happened, we almost completely shut down, almost 100% telehealth. And then over the last couple of months, we were like 10% of our patients seeing the office in April, and then like. 15% in May and 20% in June. We've slowly been reopening and now we've kind of put a hold on that because, um, uh, because coronavirus is blowing up. But there was three studies that came out last week, Lori, that showed over and above the deaths from coronavirus, there's between 28 and 50% more deaths than we know just from people not seeking care. They're having heart attacks, they're having strokes, their cancer is not getting treated. Um, aneurysms have been reported. And in my space, um, overdoses, patients who are suffering in pain are taking too much uh, pain medicine. And I'm not saying that anecdotally. I'm saying a large study looking year over year, May of 2020 versus May of last year, there was 40% more overdoses. And so I think it's a balance where we can do everything we can to treat our patients over the phone and do it. But sometimes we're just gonna to need to do a procedure. We either do an epidural that will help them or we'll do facet injections or in this uh, person's question, they may need back surgery. And I think in the big picture, if your back is bad enough that you need surgery, you probably need to get that done. And so that's kind of the message that I've been telling to people is certainly we wanna protect the elderly, we wanna protect the sick, but we also wanna make sure we remain um, here and available to treat people that are suffering. That's such a good point. And, you know, that's why we remained open. That's why we're still doing studies because, you know, obstructive sleep apnea kills way more people every year than the coronavirus. Like you need to get this treated. This is, and if your sleep apnea is treated, that's, that's good. You know, it doesn't mean it's, we're talking about untreated sleep apnea here. Those are the ones that are at ri the bigger risk. You know, it was a, once you treat your sleep apnea and you get these other things under control, you know, you should be able to fight this virus, no problem. Yeah, and I think it's a, it's a balance. I would say it slightly different than you, but I think we agree yeah. we, we need to do both. We need to, we need to treat people that have obstructive sleep apnea and we need to all be very aware that Arizona is the epicenter, the epicenter, the epicenter. So if we can see them over the phone and deliver the stuff to their house and get them back to health, um, oh, you know, without bringing them in, great. But the person who's talking about back surgery, and I'd need to know more details, but more than likely, you need to get it handled. Yeah, and I mean, I'll share my personal story. I was one of those patients that was in severe pain, and I finally had to have, you know, a back surgery. It took two back surgeries, from, and, but now I'm, I water skied. I sent my surgeon a picture of me water skiing. I haven't <laughs> water skied in eight years, and I water skied. It was so amazing. So, I highly, you know, surgery isn't for everyone, but you know, if you get to that point where you have, I had no discs, so I totally get it. But you, Arizona pain, if you're in pain until you get that surgery, they're who you want to call, right? I think so. Thanks for saying that. <laughs> we, we, uh, we've helped a lot of people here for a long time and, um, and I'm really passionate about doing it the right way where once again, if someone really needs to be on pain medicine, I understand that, but we do everything we can to get you in the lowest possible dose um, and so, you know, we enjoy what we do. I see a couple of good questions here at the end. I actually may answer one. Um, it says, what's the best way to wear a mask? 
Uh, many don't, you know, cover their noses and can the virus enter the ears? So I kind of want to hit that as a topic. The virus can enter any holes in your body. <laughs> That's the bottom line. The one that is the most obvious is your mouth. The nose is probably second. The eyes are probably third. I just read a whole long article today showing they've never really proven that it goes through the eyes, but theoretically it makes sense. Anytime it can get into the mucous membranes that get into your body through any hole, you know, it has access. The ears have really never been shown. And so there's no reason that you would need to cover your ears, but mouth, most important, nose second, eyes third. And so um, I posted a picture yesterday on Facebook of my own daughter wearing a mask over her mouth and nose, but also a shield which protects the eyes. And I think um, if you can get comfortable with an outfit like that, that's probably the best. That's what we wear when we go in the room uh, to innovate. The question after that, I think it's a two-part question from the same person, says, why has Arizona become the epicenter? That's a long question. And I would just say, we don't 100% know why this has bounced around. The, the one problem I have with that question, it's not that I have a problem with it, but trying to answer it is, a lot of times it turns into a blame game. Like, oh, we're the epicenter because this Republican or this Democrat or this policy, like it's someone else's fault. And I think it's more about the virus is kind of do, going to do what it's going to do. And sometimes it hits an area and it just explodes for whatever reason. Probably one of the best mathematical reasons that I would look at Arizona being an epicenter is because it is hot. How crazy is that? We thought that being hot would kill the virus and we wouldn't get it, right? But what it did was the virus being hot forced us all inside and we stay inside all day long and we're more likely to get it inside than outside. So that's probably the very best reason, but certainly policies that we've had are part of it as well. Uh, maybe we open too soon. Maybe our Arizona nature, we're like, you know, we're the wild, wild west and we do what we want. Maybe that's a little bit part of why we're spreading it because we're not, we're not taking it as seriously. I know you say you're in California. I was out there for a tournament last week. They were taking it a whole lot more seriously in California than we are in Arizona. So there's a lot of reasons. I just, I don't like it to be like pointing fingers at people, um, but th that would, that's my best answer on that. Great. Well, thank you so much. I know we didn't get to every single question. I'm sorry. Um, I will make sure, if you guys wanna rewatch this, I'll put it on YouTube, Valley Sleep Center's YouTube. Um, it's, it's Valley Sleep Center all squished together. And then Dr. Lynch, how do we get in touch with Arizona Pain if um, anybody here is having, we should do another Pain talk. I'd love to do that with you too again. Yeah, anytime. And thanks for having me again, Lori. I love it that you're doing this and educating. I know you're so passionate about helping people. Um, we made it easy for people years ago when I got my website. It's just ArizonaPain.com, the full word ArizonaPain.com. And uh, you can come see me or one of our other doctors. We love helping people. And, uh, you know, my main message, I I've said it already, but I just want to say it again is, you know, stay safe, stay at home as much as you can. Um, what, at, at the end of the day, the average person pre-COVID, we probably interacted with 100 people a day. You may not know it's that much, but at the grocery store, at the gas station, at work, if you can reduce that, you know, to 10 people a day or 20 people a day, you're going to drastically reduce the mathematical chance of you getting this. And just think about it as a numbers game. It doesn't have to be zero. You don't have to be a hermit. But if you can um, limit your spread down to maybe 10 people in a day, uh, a good chance you're not going to get it. Yeah. And remember that 15 minute rule. You have to be within six feet of someone unmasked for more than 15 minutes for that to be like from the time they were tested. Yeah. Or the time significant contact. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, thank you again. Um, I just want to say if you guys have any more questions, you, you're all going to get an email from me. Uh, feel free to reach out to me personally to ask. I will get the hand sanitizer recipe from you and yep. we'll email that out to everyone that attended. And feel free to reply to my email if you have any more questions. I'll also post the link for Sleep to Slender in that email for you guys for tomorrow. Good night, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Have a good evening, everyone. Bye-bye.